Hello and welcome to the section on unsupervised learning. So this is really a sudden shift in topic. We're moving on to a new section within the class. So far everything we've talked about in the class has been supervised learning and now we're going to start talking about unsupervised learning. And the idea in supervised learning is that we have pairs of records, U and V, and we want to learn a model which predicts V given U. Um, and the, it's called supervised learning because the, the VIs are giving us information about what the right answer is in particular cases corresponding to the UIs. And this is supervising is the idea, the learning of the model. In unsupervised learning, it's different. We only have records U and our goal is to build a model of the U's. Um, and so we'd like to be able to do things such as reveal the structure of the set of possible U's. Um, We'd like to be able to deal with missing entries in the U's and figure out what they are. That's called imputation. We'd like to be able to detect anomalies, unusual cases which we've not seen before. And uh, the idea of revealing structure or detecting anomalies are both kind of vague at this point and we'll make them a little bit more precise. And imputing missing entries, well, we'll see exactly how to do that. So just as before, we work with embedded data. We take our data u and we embed it into a feature vector x. x is phi of u and x is some vector that lives in R d. And then we build our data model for the vectors x. And when we need to, we unembed to go back to the raw vector u. So from now on in this section, we're going to work with the feature vectors x. So we'll have embedded data set x1 through xn. Each of these is a vector in R d. Now the way we construct a model for this data set is via a loss function. Um, we'd like to have something which characterizes the elements of the data set, which tells us what elements of the data set look like or should look like. And I'm going to do this with a loss function, which we could also call in this case an implausibility function. It's a function on Rd, which is our space of possible x's, it's real valued, and it tells us how implausible x is as a data point. So if L of x is small, then x looks like our data, it's typical. And if L of x is large, then x does not look like the data. Now the model might be probabilistic, so x might correspond to a probability distribution or a probability density, p of x, and then we would take L of x as to be the negative log of p of x, which is the negative log probability density. Uh, we might think of that as the negative log likelihood of x. Um, other names for L of x we might talk about surprise or perplexity. Um, and L is often parameterized by a vector or theta. You know, it might be a matrix theta and so we'll put a subscript theta on L, L sub theta of x. Uh, let's look at the simplest um, example. Suppose um, our data model is x is near a fixed vector theta. So the model here is parameterized by the vector theta and we're going to try and learn that from the data. Um, and you might have implausibility functions associated with this. For example, you might have the square loss which would be the sum of the squares of the two norm of x minus theta. Sorry, that's correct. Or the one norm of x minus theta, which is the sum of the absolute values 
of xi minus theta i. Uh, a different data model is the k-means data model. Here, the idea is, is that rather than just having one ideal point, one representative, we have k of them, theta 1 to theta k, all vectors in Rd. And we believe that our data is close to one of these representatives. Um, now, we measure how implausible uh, data point x is by saying what's the distance between x and the closest representative which is just the minimum from i is 1 to k of the norm of x minus theta i squared if it's the distance squared that we're using as our distance measure we might equally well use a, uh, a one norm or a different norm normally for k means k means specifically means the squared distance, the squared two norm distance. Then the model is parameterized by these uh, uh, k d dimensional vectors, which we could equally well view as a d by k matrix, which we'll call theta, whose columns are theta 1 through theta k. Now it's worth looking at what the role of the loss function is in supervised versus unsupervised learning. Uh, in supervised learning, the loss function is used to choose a particular predictor from a family of predictors parameterized by theta. And once we've chosen the predictor, we no longer really care about the loss function. Uh, the predictor itself is our model of how X and Y are related in unsupervised learning, the, the loss function plays a slightly different role because it characterizes what the data looks like. Um, but the loss function actually is the data model. Getting, getting the loss function, that's, that's the primary goal of unsupervised learning. So using this loss function enables us to build, for example, an anomaly detector. Um, and that's a, a particular way of using a data model in order to identify anomalies, suspicious feature vectors, feature vectors that aren't consistent with the other feature vectors that we've seen. Uh, for example, the a common application is, um, say, network traffic monitoring. We might have feature vectors that includes statistics of the size and distribution of packets and uh, what we do is we fit our data model we have a loss function L parameterized by theta we fit that by choosing the theta and then we'll say that if we look at all of our data x1 through xn we can look at the corresponding distribution of the loss function and we can say Let's find the percentile value, say the 99th percentile value of that loss function. So that 99% of the values that we've observed of L of X are less than or equal to T. And then when we're getting new data coming in, as we're watching the network, if we, every time we get an X, we evaluate the loss function on it, we will flag it as anomalous if the loss function is greater than our threshold t. It's greater than that 99% percentile value. Um, and this is a, a anomaly detector. We can also use our data model to impute missing entries. So we'll suppose that x has some entries missing. We might label them with question marks or NA or NAN for not available or for not a number um, within the data set. And uh, we'd like to fill in those missing data entries. So uh, uh, for any given vector x, we've got 
a subset of the numbers 1 through D, which is the set of known entries. We'll call that set script K for that data element X. And um, uh, we're going to replace X with X hat. And X hat is going to be such that, well, its value on the known entries, on um, if i is one of the known uh, is one of the known entries, then we'll have x hat i equal to x i. Uh, if i is not one of the known entries, well then we're going to have to fill it in, and we're going to have x hat hat i is a question mark that we're going to have to replace. So on the slide here we have an example where um, uh, x here has um, uh, dimension 4 and k is 1 3 which means we know the first and the third entry of x and our job is going to be to fill in these unknown entries here we fill them in with minus 1.5 and 3.4 and this quantity on the right is x hat and the in, the first and the third entry of x hat are uh, forced to be equal to the first and the third entries of x because we know the first and the third entries but our job is to fill in the others and of course k is, might be different for each of our different uh, data records so for each i we might have a different k so uh, an example of this is for say a recommendation system um, uh, the features here are different movies and um, the examples are customer ratings so we will have D different movies and uh, N different customers and each customer has filled in ratings for some of the movies so if D could be very large, if we look at the Netflix catalog, there may be many thousands of different possible movies. And so X, say, is a vector in R 10,000. But for each particular customer, they may have only watched a few of the movies, and so most of the entries will be question marks. And then some of the entries will be rated. Maybe they'll be rated on a Likert scale from 1 to 5. Um, and then... Our job is to impute the entries, the missing entries. And that tells us what rating the customer would give if they rated that particular movie. And then we're going to use this information to actually make a recommendation. We will look for each customer at the imputed values and find um, those imputed values which are large. So movies that they would have rated large if only they'd rated it. And uh, we'll send a recommendation to them saying, you might like this movie. And this is exactly um, uh, what is called the, the Netflix challenge, where uh, uh, a few years ago now, there was a prize offered by Netflix for to, to people to build a recommendation system uh, which could impute ratings in this way. Another application would be to fill in missing features for supervised learning. So you're trying to do supervised learning, you're trying to do classification or regression, and uh, your X's have some missing features. Um, and so far what we've done is removed records that have missing features. Um, all of the methods we've seen so far have required us to have every uh, data record I have an XI which is complete. It can't have any question marks or NAs in there. Um, and sometimes you do lose a substantial fraction of the data. Um, so, uh, uh, so for example, uh, some of the data sets we looked at earlier, for example, we looked at an Australian weather data set. Uh, we lost a substantial fraction of the data by eliminating those uh, 
those records which were just missing one element. Um, and so an alternative approach would be to use into imputation to fill in the missing feature entries and then use the filled in data set to do supervised learning. Another thing you can use imputation for is to detect anomalous entries. So here we're not trying to detect anomalous records, but anomalous entries. So particular components of uh, a particular X. So what do we do? Well, for each I, we pretend that the X I, the I component of X is question mark is unknown, and we impute to find x hat of i. We impute based on all the other entries of x. And if xi and x hat i are very different, well then we'll flag xi as anomalous. Um, in the case of our movies example, we've identified movies which we would expect based on all the other movies that the person has rated that they would not have liked. But actually they gave it a high rating. Or vice versa. Um, now, the distinction between supervised learning and unsupervised learning is not so great. Um, in particular, one can view supervised learning as a special case of imputation. Uh, or at least one can formulate supervised learning as a special case of imputation. Um, so suppose we want to predict y based on x. Well, and we have this training data x1 to xn, y1 to yn. We'll construct a new set of records consisting of d plus m dimensional vectors, x tilde. Each x tilde is simply x stacked up on top of y. Um, now, we build a data model for x tilde using this training data. And then we impute the last m entries of x tilde. And it so happens that every record is missing the last m entries of x tilde. Now in order to use a data model to perform imputation, we look at our vector xi and we say, well, we don't know what some of the entries are, but we know what the other entries are. So the entries that we don't know, we're going to choose by picking them such that the loss function L is minimum. So specifically we say well I've got a loss function, it's a function of an X. I'm going to fix the components that I know and I'm going to allow myself to vary the components that I don't know. And we minimize the implausibility which is just the loss function. So this is a very natural thing to do and it turns out that it works very well. So here's, here's an example. So here we have a constant data model. And um, so we have a bunch of data points here shown in red. And we have our theta, which is the parameter that specifies the model. Our model says that the, we expect all of the data to be close to theta. In other words, we have a loss function, which is the norm of x minus theta squared. First thing we do is we pick the theta, given the data, and that gives us that the theta is the mean of those data points. The second thing we do is we say, well, we've got a theta, and now we're going to uh, find, uh, solve an imputation problem. And in our imputation problem, we are given an x with a missing entry. So we know x, it has uh, two components. Um, the first one is unknown, and the second one is 2.8. And that means that the true x 
It's somewhere along this line. Somewhere along the line of vectors x, which have second component equal to 2.8. We get to pick x1, and the way we're going to do that is by minimizing the loss function over x1, subject to the constraint that x2 is 2.8. And now that gives us this point right here. We get to move along this line, along that line, to get as close as possible as we can to theta, theta being right there. And that turns out to be x hat 1 is 0 0.79. If we have a, a k-means data model, well, here we have an x with some unknown entries. Now, the loss function is the minimum over i of the norm of x minus theta i squared. So, in other words, you look over all of your k different theta vectors, your k different archetypes, pick the one that's closest to x, and look at the distance between x and that closest archetype squared and that gives you the loss. Now, we've got an x that has some missing entries, and so when we do this, well, some of the entries are fixed. We can't do anything about those. And uh, the other entries, we get to minimize the loss function with respect to. So the first thing we do is we say, well, let's find the nearest representative theta j to x but we can only use the known entries. And that means that instead of looking at the two norm, we have to look at the sum over all of the known entries, the i's in k, and look at the, at that sum of xi minus the ith component of theta j squared. That is the loss function here evaluated, let's include the minimum, evaluated where we've allowed the components that we don't know to be free. And when we allow the components that we don't know to be free, well, they gravitate to be such that x sub i is equal to the ith component of theta j, because that minimizes that loss. And so we end up with a, lo with a, a loss that has only these terms left in it. So just to be explicit about that, the minimum over i of the norm of x minus theta i norm squared, that's our L of x. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize L of x subject to the constraint that x, x hat, x hat i is equal to x i for i in the known set. And if I take the minimum of this L of x, I end up with minimizing over uh, x hat, the minimum over i of the norm of x hat minus theta, I guess I've used i twice, uh, let's use j for one of them. Let's replace that one with a j. Uh, x minimum over j minus theta j norm squared, and uh, this minimum on the outside is uh, a minimum with respect to the unknown components. Minimize with respect to unknown components of x hat. 
And uh, if we minimize with respect to the unknown components of x hat, this quantity, well, one thing I can do is swap the order of the minimizations. And that becomes the minimum over j, the minimum over the unknowns of the norm of x hat minus theta j. And this, well, if I'm, if I'm allowed to choose the unknown components of x hat to minimize that quantity, what am I going to do? I'm going to make the unknown components equal to the corresponding components of theta j. And that leaves me with this part of the cost function here equal to just this. So that, uh, that tells us how to pick the uh, the representative corresponding to a particular x tells us how to pick j. And then what we want to do is we want to pick the unknown components. Well, we already know what they are. They have to be equal such, they have to be such that x hat i is equal to the ith component of c to j. So for the unknown entries, what we do is we guess the entries of the closest representative. So we have a, a data model, and just like in supervised learning, we need to be able to validate that our data model is actually good, and our imputation method is actually good. And we do this in the following way. We split the data into a training set and a test set. We use the training set to build the data model. And then what we do is we look at the test set and we mask out some of the entries in the test set. We pretend they're unknown. And we impute those entries and then look at the average error of the imputed values. So the RMSE, for example. And that validates that our imputation method is working correctly. And we would typically pick the training and the test split randomly or by k-fold validation. That would be fine. And then we would, in order to do the masking, we would typically mask randomly, mask random entries within the test set. So how do we fit a data model? We have um, x1 to xn. And uh, let's suppose we have no missing entries. And we have a parameterized implausibility function L theta of x. How do we choose the parameter theta? Well, we minimize the empirical risk, the average implausibility. That's 1 on n times the sum from i is 1 to n of L theta of xi. We choose theta to minimize this, and we may have some constraints on theta. Sometimes the allowed thetas are limited in some way. Um, and then we choose the parameter theta so that the observed data is the least implausible. Let's look at the simplest case, the sum of squares loss. So the loss function is L theta of x is the norm of x minus theta squared. The empirical loss is the average of that quantity. And we've seen this before when we were looking at the constant predictor problem with the square loss, that the uh, best choice of theta, the minimizing choice of theta, is the mean of the data vectors. If we have the absolute loss, some absolute loss, well, again, this is uh, exactly like the constant predictor case. Here in the unsupervised case, we will have a loss function, which is the norm of x minus theta, the one norm, so the sum of the absolute values of the components of x minus theta. And we look at the empirical loss, and the optimal theta 
is the median of the data vectors x1 to xn. And what this means is the element-wise median of the data vectors. Then the k-means model goes like this. The implausibility function or the loss function is the, the norm squared of the distance between x and the closest archetype theta j. And so our parameter is a d by k matrix. Equivalently, it's simply k d-dimensional vectors, theta 1 through theta k. Now the empirical loss is therefore the uh, uh, average of that over all of the data points. So that's 1 on n, the sum from i is 1 to n, and then for each i we have to find the closest uh, archetype theta j and look at the distance between xi and theta j. And of course, which closest archetype that is depends on which data point you have. And this is the called the k-means objective function. And we use an algorithm called the k-means algorithm to minimize this. So this is one of the cases where we have a specific problem, which is the k-means optimization problem we've discussed, and the algorithm has the same name, which is a little confusing because one could use different algorithms to solve the same problem. So, but the most commonly used algorithm is called the k-means algorithm. And the way it works is that for any given choice of these k vectors theta 1 through theta k. Well, I've got these k vectors and then I've got a bunch of data points. And each data point, its contribution to the loss is the distance to its closest archetype. And so we can say let's assign to each data point a corresponding archetype. The archetype which is the closest to that data point. And we're going to label that assignment with a, a vector c in Rn. And the idea is, is that ci is a number between 1 and k, which tells us which of the thetas has been assigned to that data point. In other words, which of the thetas is the closest to that data point. And then this loss function, which is the empirical risk, is 1 on n, the sum from i is 1 to n, of the distance squared between xi and its closest archetype. Well, that's explicitly 1 on n times the sum from i is 1 to n of this quantity, xi minus theta ci, because ci is the assignment. Now, what we want to do is we want to choose both C and the thetas. So we have to choose the assignment and choose the corresponding thetas. Once we've chosen the thetas, the assignment's easy. Right? The assignment is that we assign to E to the ith data point the closest archetype. So we find over J the minimum of Xi minus theta J the norm of xi minus theta j squared. And that's what ci is, is it's which of the j's minimizes that quantity. How do we minimize the thetas? Well, we can minimize this quantity once we've fixed the ci's. So first of all, we'll do the assignment we'll find the best CIs. And then, minimizing the thetas is straightforward, over the thetas is straightforward, because each of these, this quantity here, splits up into K different terms. One for those data points assigned to theta 1, another for the data points assigned to theta 2, and so on. And so it becomes, 
well, it becomes this. It becomes uh, 1 on n times the sum over all i, such that ci is 1 of the norm of xi minus theta 1 squared plus 1 on n times the sum over all i such that ci is 2 of the norm of xi minus theta 2 squared and so on up to k. And each one of those, we, we would like to minimize that sum over theta 1 through theta k. And so to find the minimum over theta 1, we minimize this over theta 1. And minimizing that over theta 1 simply tells us to set theta 1 to be the mean of the corresponding xi's. To minimize this over theta 2, we set theta 2 to be the mean of the corresponding Xi's, in other words, all of the Xi's which have been assigned to category 2, and so on. Once we do that, well, then we've got new theta i's, and that means that the assignment might change. And so we reassign, we go, th we, we go through, and once again, pick the C's that that assign each xi to the closest theta j. That's a new assignment, and that means that the thetas are going to change, and so we go through and we update all the thetas to be the corresponding means of their assigned data points. And we alternate between these two steps. Assign data points to archetypes, then adjust the archetypes to be the mean of their assigned data points, then assign data points to archetypes, and so on. And this is a heuristic for approximately minimizing this empirical risk. Here's an example. So we start out with uh, some guesses for theta. And we might initialize those completely randomly. That would be very common. So here there are three guesses. This is, say, theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. Um, and now, given those guesses for the thetas, we can make assignments. All of the points for which, which are closest to theta 1 then any of the other thetas are being colored in red. The points that are closest to theta 2 are colored blue, and the points that are closest to theta 3 are colored green. Remember, we don't have any colors associated with our data. Our data is just points. But once we've picked thetas, we can label the data points. And those labels are the CIs. So all of these red points are those points for which ci is 1, the blue points are points for which ci is 2, and the green points are points for which ci is 3. So now we've got an assignment. We've picked the c's by painting the points in their appropriate colors. Now we can see that, well, these thetas don't minimize the empirical risk with those assignments because I can make the empirical risk smaller by moving this theta to the mean of all of these data points, which is somewhere here. And I can move this theta to the mean of its assigned data points there, and this one doesn't move very much. Maybe it moves a little bit in uh, this direction, say. So I move them, and this is where they end up. And now that I've moved them, I can reassign each data point to its closest archetype that changes their colors. So now I've got the same data points, but I've recolored them according to their closest archetype. So now these are the red ones here, these are the blue ones, and these are the green ones. 
And we can see that some data points have changed from red to blue and some have changed from blue to red. Not, none of the green ones have changed. And so now I've reassigned data points. My archetypes are no longer in the best possible place. I adjust my archetypes to be the mean of their corresponding data points. So this one's going to move up a bit. This one's going to move down a bit. And uh, I keep going until I converge, alternating between assigning colors and taking the means. And here's the sort of convergence you see. This is converged very quickly. After four iterations, we've completely converged. And, uh, and notice that this converges perfectly in the sense that once, we've, uh, once we're not changing the assignments C anymore, well, then the thetas don't change either. And so this isn't a... Uh, this reaches a point where the thetas are stuck and no longer move at all. Here we can look at the uh, both the, te the training loss and the test loss and the imputation error. And so you can see here in blue there's the training loss. Um, in green you can see the test loss follows pretty closely. And then the red is the imputation error. And this tells, and this is as a function of k, the number, the parameter, which is the number of archetypes we're choosing. And so how do we choose this? Well, this suggests that maybe we should pick a k somewhere around four or five, or maybe even three. Um, so I guess this is one, this is two, three. So we should pick a k that's three, which is quite reasonable if we look at our data set. Our data set really does split naturally into three clusters, and our algorithm has found that. And then we can validate by removing either U1 or U2 from each record in the test set and computing the RMSE.